Hi. <coughs> it's my great pleasure to have uh, introduced Professor Ian Frigard from the uh, Department of Mechanical Engineering and Applied Mathematics at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. Uh, Professor Frigard uh, <coughs> obtained his uh, BSc in Mathematics from Cardiff and then he did his uh, Diesel in Engineering Sciences from Oxford University. He had several positions, both academic and industrial, worked at Schlumberger and also in Austria before joining uh, the back of, uh, of the, uh, the faculty in the University of British Columbia. And uh, he works, he is on actually several editorial boards, including Journal of non Mechanics, Mechanics, Journal of Engineering, Mathematics, Mechanica, and Advances in Mechanical Engineering. My introduction to Frigard's work was when I started looking at uh, I joined the uh, Petroleum Engineering Department in 2007. I started looking at my background in student mechanics. I want to look at what kind of petroleum engineering problems are solved in fundamental level of fluid mechanics. First thing I will do is look at the FF papers and physics of fluid papers. And one of the key people that came out in like looking at very few guys in petroleum engineering types of applications would publish in those uh, uh, fluid mechanics jobs. Frigard's name came up. I started looking at uh, primary cementing job analysis there, and that's what I thought would be a very good problem for one of my very first uh, master's students, and in fact, turned into second master's students, uh, to do CFD for, and one was kind of inspired by Frigard's work, so it's a pleasure. So please join me in welcoming Professor Frigard. Mind, 
and uh, every now and again he would unleash that on on, uh, on the graduate students that were, were around him. It was always fun to watch if you weren't that graduate student. <laughs> so maybe I'll, I'll come back to this uh, little, little quote of his at the end, and uh, we'll, we'll maybe, uh, may, may, maybe it's, uh, it's not as dismal as he makes out. Okay, so uh, primary semantics, many of you are, are very familiar with this. Um, basically, what, what we do is we drill a big hole in the ground, and we uh, take out the drill pipe, left with some drilling mud, we push in a steel casing and joints, and then we start to pump a sequence of fluids um, inside the casing and around the outside. Okay, so maybe we start first with a, a space of fluid or maybe even a wash in front of that. Then we pump uh, in one or more slurries. These go down to the bottom of the well, back up the outside, and it ends up just like that, completely perfect. And uh, and then you, you move on to, to drilling the next the next set of the well. Okay, so that's the idealized um, version of primary cement. And um, in fact, the, the operation is it's a it's a little bit uh, more more complicated. Um, so first of all, let's just talk about why we're doing it. Well, we want to, we want to support the well. We, we don't want the well to leak. Okay, that's the, the process objectives. Um, so uh, the, the leakage is really to, to keep the productivity high. Um, and uh, another objective when you're doing it, which is more recent, of course, is you want to maintain well control. And that's, uh, in a sense, that's, that should be a given during primary cement, but as, as we recently saw, it doesn't always work out that way. So where's the fluid mechanics in this in this process? So if you come back to here, this is a this is a, a pipe geometry on the inside and this is a, an annular geometry on the outside. Uh, you can see there are two displacement geometries, the, the pipe and the annulus. And in the casing, it's in the, in the pipe it's going down and in the annulus the, the fluids are coming up. And uh, the fluids we're pumping are, have, have different densities, different rheologies. And the other issues are the geometry is quite variable. The inclination of the well can vary. Uh, the, the casing is often eccentric. So it's always eccentric. Um, and the, but the geometry itself is quite long and thick. It's a, it's a hydraulics type problem. And uh, the, the next complication is that we deal with a number of different flow rates in, in the process. OK, so flows are from laminar to turbulent. And, um, in general, the, the, the turbulent displacements tend to work a bit better than the laminar displacements. Okay, so, so the area I work in mostly is, is the laminar displacements. So um, some of the issues, these are these are really issues, I, I, I guess, uh, uh, from a Canadian perspective, where well, we're drilling uh, typically about 10 to 20,000 wells, depending on the year, and that mostly in Western Canada. Uh, a large number of these have pressure at surface. So what that really means is once you once you finish the cementing and you look at the at the surface, in some way gas has percolated to the surface, or could be another liquid, but uh, typically gas. Okay. So they're not necessarily all all leaking, uh, but there, there's definitely pressure at surface. Okay. Um, and it's very variable, which kind of indicates that the process is not really well well uh, well engineered. Okay, so one study in 2002, you can see a, a, a very wide range of defects. Um, so why is this? Well, I, I think part of it is, is really due to various uh, management issues about the, the position of cementing within the industry. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about that. But basically, uh, you know, the quality evaluation isn't very good. And often the people who are, who are, um, who are forming the cementing job, you know, it's a service company, and the person who's contracting that um, isn't the same person in that the company who's going to experience the loss in production later. Okay, so the positioning of, of cementing is, is, is I think, poor in the business. Okay. I think that's that's a, a key point why why the, the industry is better regulated. Um, but for me, it's just a fun fluid mechanics problem. Okay. Um, so this is what it what it looks like. Um, it's a fluid mechanics problem that uh, is, is not uh, not done in the lab. Okay, it's uh, say big trucks, pumps, and toys for boys. This is the, the characteristic of much of the oil industry. 
and uh, somehow it's maybe gotten done at night. I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, and uh, uh, these are the, the types of fluids we're trying to uh, displace in the annulus. So it's a pretty dirty drilling mask, the cleaner one. And there are various bits of machinery that go down the well. Okay. So what does all this mean for um, the fluid mechanics perspective? Well, it means that we are preparing the fluids, okay, often in remote areas. Okay. They may be designed in a clean lab environment, but where we actually prepare them, you know, we've often got local water, um, the suppliers are not uniform um, across the country. So um, but pretty often we don't, uh, we don't really have a good control of, uh, of what's being pumped down the hole. Okay. And maybe, uh, you know, it's pretty clear we can get the density of what can come down, okay? But the rheology, you know, I, I, I don't think we really, we really get the rheology that we think we get from designing the fluids in the lab. Okay? And, uh, of course, the people who may design the job are not the ones who are, who are pumping the job. Okay? So it's not the most interesting uh, job to do. Um, and then there's these inherent uncertainties. How big is the well? How hot is it? That down hole, uh, the properties of the fluids currently in the well, okay, it might have been conditioned or not. Um, and so we've got all really all of this stuff is, is the, the, the problems in thinking about this as a as a nice clean fluid mechanics problem. Okay. And the other problem is that whatever we we whatever we do in terms of doing research on this problem, the solution has to come down to fit into the process design. Okay, the process design from a fluid mechanics perspective is I'm going to pump fluid one, this volume, these properties, this length of time, at this rate. Okay, so you know, we, we can do a lot of fancy fluid mechanics, but if the answer at the end doesn't somehow <coughs> fit into this, into this um, uh, schematic, then it's going to be very hard for, for uh, industry to, to use anything you're doing. So it's kind of a uh, interesting perspective, but I think you need to really uh, think about the problem you're solving and, and who's going to use it. Ian, could I just, because I'm not familiar with this at all, say a little bit more about what's leaking and where? Is is it that in the annulus, at the surface around the annulus, there's gas leaking, there's fluid leaking? Uh, what's yeah, so what, I mean, it's really. Uh, it could be a, a variety of things, but it, it's liquid leaking. So the idea is that when you're finished here, okay, what you would like is for the cement to displace every other fluid, okay, and so you'd like that the, the cement forms a, a hydraulic seal. Okay, so in the, in the formation here, you, you may have strata, you know, of gas, oil under pressure, and uh, it's, it's a bit like uh, you know, puncturing a balloon. Okay, if you if you're going to connect. Uh, what's happening down here in the reservoir with the surface, then yeah, there's, a, there's a pressure point in the, the, line, the surface. So we don't, we don't you know, it, it's, typically it's gas, okay, because you know, the gas migrate is the easiest. Um, but uh, it, it, could, it could be other, other liquids as well. And it just depends on, on the situation. Um, okay. Okay, so when, when we start to do uh, uh, fluid mechanics, I, I think uh, I think we have to be careful about what we what we do. And I, and I think really, um, you know, there, there are smart people in the industry. Um, you know, maybe they're not the ones pumping pumping the jobs day in day out. Um, uh, but really, uh, you know, the people who are going to design these jobs have to have uh, an understanding of the, the fluid physics, which is which is robust under all of this uncertainty. Okay. And it's coded into a simple enough way that it can be incorporated into that design. Okay, so that's the, that's the key thing. Um, and I say here that, that you know, cementing companies really should not run 3D CFD code over the scale of the well box. So I appreciate this is a computing uh, seminar, but this would be the, the, the worst thing in the world to do. I mean, because just just consider the amount of data you, you've got and the time it's going to take you, and you're you're really trying to design. A, a, you know, basically a hydraulic pumping schedule, okay? And so you, you, you've got to somehow horse grain that, um, that, that flow, okay? You can't, you can't really deal with the, the full complexity, okay? 
So there's definitely a place for doing 2D CFD, but it's not on that scale, and it's not in the company when you're dividing a job. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so let's move on. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is, is the, the problem in the casing. It's what we call a downward displacement, the pumping from the top downwards. And, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> What we want to, uh, to do is, is uh, understand a little bit of the physics of this type of process. So here I've got a cement slag and a spacer. But let's just say I've got two fluids being pumped down the hole. And typically one of them is, is much denser than the other. Okay, So there's a tendency for the heavier fluid to pass through the, the lighter fluid. And what we'd like to do is understand some of the fundamentals of this process. Okay. And we want to do that in a, in a situation that's complex enough that it's got some relevance to the process, but simple enough that we can understand that. Okay. And so when we, we first look at it, the, the, the first thing we, we, we see is uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of parameters. Okay. So we go to the simplest, uh, what you might call hydraulics style problem, okay, which would be a long section of pipe. Uh, you know, you can say maybe 10 meters or, or, or uh, 20 meters, that kind of length, you know, and uh, uh, or, or in feet. Uh, kind of We're nominally metric in Canada, but, uh, but we still yeah, we measure we measure in meters, except in uh, in the oil field and in and in uh, lumber, where machines are still in <coughs> in, uh, in imperial. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what we would do, we would take a, a nice section here uh, of pipe, and let's look at uh, two fluids displacing. Okay, so the blue fluid is pumping uh, downwards and displacing the red fluid, and many of the fluids are water-based, so we'll take them to be admissible. And um, you know, the biggest effect, uh, quite clearly, is the density difference. So we're going to retain that. Uh, we're going to work initially with Newtonian fluids because. Once we include the biology, then we have a large number of additional parameters to care about. And we're even going to say that they're the same viscosity. And we we'll sort of pump this at a, at a flow rate, at a fixed flow rate. Okay, so it seems like a very simple problem, um, uh, but, not, but not so. Okay, and, and indeed, it, this uh, simple problem is largely untouched maybe 10 years ago. So first thing we, we, we like to do is uh, take a, a classical approach to dimensional analysis. Okay, so uh, when you, you look at the simple problem, uh, we can write down some of the parameters: uh, the pipe diameter, the flow rate, the viscosity, the densities, maybe molecular diffusivity if you're admissible, uh, gravity, inclination angle, and we end up doing uh, using a Buckingham pi theorem, okay, which is I, I assume important. Volume engineering, chemical engineering, definitely mechanical engineering, talking every type of engineering, and you end up with uh, uh, with five dimensionless groups. Okay, so if you think about that, um, before you even start doing anything, you know we, we've simplified this problem quite a bit. We've still got five groups. You know, I'm just thinking, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to try and do a? Uh, are you going to do experiments with five groups? What's uh, but it's 10 to the 5. That's, you know, that, that's a long lifetime for a graduate student. <laughs> you know, and, and so yeah, you're, you're not going to do more than a few experiments a day, I can imagine. Okay? And uh, same thing with CFD, you know, same issue. Okay? So even five groups is enormous if you, if you want to start analyzing processes. So what, what do we, um, you know, um, we do? Well, we, we Maybe uh, look a slightly more complicated model where we would write down uh, the Navier Stokes equations. Okay, and so this is what's called a um, CDE formulation, a convection diffusion equation formulation. Uh, so the fluids are miscible, and we're modeling the two phases here through a concentration. Okay, and we scale the equations in the obvious way with the you know, using the, the pipe diameter mean flow is the velocity scale, and uh, we end up with five dimensionless groups. Okay, so we know that we did the Buckingham 
pi theorem, and here are the five groups. So we've got uh, the inclination angle called beta, something called an Atwood number, which is a scaled density difference, a Reynolds number we're all familiar with, a Froude number, and this is what we sometimes call a densimetric or modified Froude number. Okay, the Atwood number comes in here. Okay, and you see what that's doing? That's reducing the effect of gravity. Okay, so that what this really represents here is a ratio of um, inertial forces to buoyancy forces. Okay, so that's really the, that's what that, that balance is. And finally, we've got a, a Peclet number. Okay, so that's the objective uh, component of transport to the diffusive component of transport. So, uh, five, uh, five groups. Okay, we could take a, a different five groups. We could deal with uh, uh, immiscible fluids. Okay, and if we dealt with immiscible fluids, well, we wouldn't have a Peclet number, but we'd have a Guillery number or, or something like that. Okay, but you don't get away with less than five. So um, now, uh, why write these equations down? Well, the, firstly, this would be a, a reasonable model to solve on a computer. Secondly, we see where the different terms appear. And what's kind of interesting is that this average number, the effect of the density difference in fluid mechanics comes in two places. One is here. So these are the inertial terms. And uh, what, does this, what, what does this mean here? Well, when you have a, 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 an output number here, it means that the, uh, the effect of the density difference on inertial accelerations is different in the two fluids. Okay, so you know, the heavier fluid is going to be harder to accelerate. Okay, in simple terms. The other place is over here. Okay, in the fluid number because we have the output number there. Okay, and this is kind of an interesting thing in, in fluid mechanics is that we uh, can play around with these two things. And um, what we, we really have to have in cementing is we have to have this term. Okay? We know that buoyancy is a very significant force. Okay? The, the, the density of cement is you know, about 1.8, and, and you know, a, a, the mud could be 1.2. So you, know, you can be 50% larger. Okay? So you can get massive buoyancy forces. Okay? So this has got to be there. But what about this? Well, actually, in, in fluid mechanics, you know, this, this term uh, that doesn't actually do a great deal. Okay? So you can make your life a lot simpler, both computationally and in doing experiments, if you just ignore this. Okay? And so what is that? how do you ignore that? Well, you can ignore that if this is small. Okay? So that means you're using the same density fluids, or close to small density difference. But you can still have a large buoyancy force. The buoyancy is measured here. Okay? So we can get large buoyancy forces with small density difference. And that's a big trick of doing experimental fluid mechanics. Okay? And when we want to do it in the modeling sense, we call this the, the Roussinesse approximation. Okay, so, um, so what happens? Well, uh, the, other, the other place you, we can simplify is this term here is generally going to be very small. So the Peclet number is typically very, very large in these systems. And what does that mean? It means that the, um, the, the fluids, uh, well, they may mix, okay? But if they mix, they mix because the flow has become unstable, okay? They're not going to mix over a reasonable time scale due to molecular diffusion, okay? So we can um, kind of simplify things by crossing that out, which is really saying that uh, I don't need to care about it, okay? That's one parameter less, and crossing that out, okay? So what that means is I'm left with three three-dimensional maps. And that's 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 within the lifetime of a graduate student. You know. So that's that's really the unit, the fundamental unit of university research. You know, it's not the it's not the dollar, it's the lifetime of a graduate student. Okay. So um, that's uh, that's kind of what we what we, we do, and we want to play around in this this playground here. Okay? And then later we can bring in non-Newtonian effects into this system. Okay, so sorry, that's been a while. Um, okay, so we started off um, looking at what the, the things that have already been done in the, in the literature. There's a very nice study done by Thomas Seon uh, in the early 2000s, and he studied uh, systems where there was no imposed flow rate. Okay, so what he did, he had a, a pipe, and he would close the ends of the pipe, 
and you would have a heavy fluid on the top and a light fluid on the bottom, separated by a gate valve, and at t equals zero, he would open the gate valve. Okay, and watch what happened. And this is from, uh, from his experiments, and I'm going to show you the, the, the two main effects. I need So what you're seeing here is that the top half of Thomas's uh, pipe, um, and this is an inclination of 30 degrees. So the same pipe carries on down here. It's got dark fluid in, and the the, the flow you would observe is very very similar. Okay, so he, he what he's using here is water, water with salt. Okay, so again small density difference, but big buoyancy effect. Okay, and what you saw there in the first uh, situation you saw a, a very inertial flow with a lot of mixing and now when we go to 85 degrees okay get a small output number you can see that you get near complete segregation okay so this is really the main the main transition we're getting in these flows okay between flows like this which you call inertial uh, viscous flows and the flows you saw at 30 degrees which we call inertial flows okay so the inertial flows lead eventually to, to large scale mixing Okay. And, and these one need the segregation. So uh, Seon uh, characterized his flows. Uh, he was an uh, experimentalist. He uh, characterized them through two velocities, uh, what we call a, a, a viscous velocity scale, and what he called the inertial velocity scale. So this represents the balance between viscous and buoyant forces, and this one between inertial and buoyant forces. And what he found was that, um, you know, with these two pra parameters uh, and the inclination, he could characterize the transition between the inertial and the, and the viscous uh, by a ratio of V nu over Vt cos beta of around 50. Okay, and we can uh, we, you know, we, we can express this also in terms of our, our own parameters. Okay, so um, we uh, adopted uh, a little bit of this terminology and his insight. And now what we're going to do, but well, we're not going to have no flow, we're going to start pumping. Okay, so V0 would be non-zero. And you can see I've got three velocities, so I can make two dimensionless ratios. Okay, and then I've got a, uh, an, an angle, so that's my third dimensionless number. Okay, so I can rewrite the Reynolds number and the fluid in terms of uh, the ratios of these velocities. If I want. So I haven't, I'm not doing any tricks. I mean, there's so just three numbers. Okay, so um, what, did, what did we do uh, on this problem? The first thing we, we, we looked at was uh, flows in the horizontal pipes. Okay, so why did we do that? Well, we, we saw this nice structured flow. Okay, we saw that the, when, you, when the inclination angle is high, you have this nice viscous layer. Okay, so that seems like an easier problem to look at than the one where things begin to mix. So we built uh, an apparatus. And this is the type of experiment. It was modeled very much on, on Theon's experiments. Uh, we, would, uh, we would gravity feed to remove any, uh, any oscillations from the pumps. We would have a gate valve. We would fill up two fluids. We'd open the gate valve and we'd film the experiment. Then we would process the images from the experiment by, um, by basically integrating them across the, 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 uh, uh, the pipe. Okay, we integrate the, the grayscale value. Okay, and this gives a representation of the concentration of fluids, and we would plot these on a we call it spatial temporal diagram. So here, this represents the length down the pipe measured from the gate valve, and this represents time. Okay, so we start in this part here with a black colored fluid. We open the valve and see that as time goes on here, we become progressively gray. Okay, so that, re that reflects the mean concentration. And so if I'm at a position here, okay, where this fluid up here is black and this one is clear, then I would have a, a gray value here that represents the, if you like, the height of that interface. Okay? So we did this and we performed a, a, a large number of experiments at, um, at angles of inclination that were, were close to, to horizontal. And we saw some interesting things. So this would be a sequence of experiments where we have fixed the two fluids, we fixed the inclination, and we perform 
sets of experiments at different pumping rates. Okay, so we're increasing uh, the pumping rate. Okay, and what we're doing after each experiment is we are extracting from this diagram a line, which uh, may not be clear to you, but it's clear at the MATLAB. Okay, so you can have a an edge detection algorithm that detects the, the, the edge. Okay, you might say there's not much of an edge there, but there's enough of an edge. And what is this edge? This is the um, this edge is the represents the speed in which this front propagates down downstream. Okay, and the speed that the front propagates downstream is is faster than the mean flow rate, faster than the mean speed. Okay, because uh, You've got not just the, the, the pumping velocity, but also buoyancy is driving driving this head of the displacement. Okay, so we we would do that, and uh, for a lot for, for we sequence these experiments, and we would get things that looked a bit like this. Okay, and there are three regimes that we we noticed here. So uh, in the first regime. low velocity and um, so the flow is dominated by buoyancy. You saw that the, the interface kind of stretched out initially and now and then suddenly it became quite inertial mix. Okay? This is the second regime, okay, so slightly higher flow rates. And what we're getting here, okay, we had a slightly unstable thing to start with, but now as this displacement carries on, you can see that I've got this nice being stratified into this. Okay? And in the third regime, this one's pretty quick. Washes that. Okay? So, um, what we found, we found a, a regime here where, let's say, the front velocity is more or less constant. Then we had a linear regime, and then we had a, a regime up here where I think mix would come terribly. Okay? So we had, we had a transition from uh, what we call an exchange dominated flow to a uh, and proposed flow dominated, and finally to a mixed regime. Okay, and um, we 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 took some other measurements. This was uh, the, the the spatial temporal from the inertial regime, and this was the spatial temporal from the viscous regime. Um, what you can see in the viscous regime is there are there are actually two fronts here. This one we could we can uh, quite clearly get a, a front velocity here, but there's a second front velocity. Here and so this front is is really the, the tail end of the displacement. Okay, so that's moving along as well. So the front, the first front moves off quite fast, and then there's a, a trailing front that moves much slower. And we were able to uh, uh, measure the velocity. We have a thing called the UDV, an after Doppler uh, velocimeter that measures the velocity along the line. And you can see they're quite different characteristics between the inertial flows where we have a lot of instability and, and uh, Things beginning to mix with the interface and the viscous flows, where uh, we, we end up having um, you know, fairly, fairly uh, regular um, distribution of velocity. Okay. So, um, what, what we did, we we we, we kind of like uh, this regime. Okay. We like this regime because the uh, the displacement appears to be much easier. Okay. We have this nice interface that, that moves down the, down the stream. And so this is where we, you know, we decided that we could uh, model this. And so we we want to um, essentially make make things a lot a lot uh, a lot simpler for ourselves. So what what do we do? We we adopt a, a classical methodology from uh, fluid mechanics. Okay, where we um, Instead of solving the, the Navier slopes, which in this case would be three dimensional, we we look at what's happening. Okay, and what, what's happening is the interface spreads out. Okay, we know that when things spread out and become quasi 1D, we know that we have a simplification in the stress field. Okay, and so the principal stresses are the shear stresses, and we can in that case simplify the momentum balance considerably, and we are able to. Uh, um, then integrate across the channel. Okay. This is uh, the same approach that we use in in, um, in doing problems in tribology, okay, or problems in, uh, in thin film flows, okay, 
So it's a very, very old fashioned approach. And this is really what, what we did here. And what that does is it reduces the, the Navier-Stokes equations to, to one equation. Okay? And this is, in this equation, alpha here is the, the volume fraction, or the area fraction, of the heavy fluid. Okay? So we have a, a pipe, okay? And as the, the flow stratifies, the cross section just looks like it. Okay? And according to this area fraction, we are able to make an approximation to the velocity field. Okay? Using that velocity field, we are able to, okay, so, so alpha here depends on the height, which is here. Okay? And using that, that geometry, we are able to approximate the velocity field and work out uh, the, the volumetric flux of, flow, of fluid. Okay? So that's the flux flowing through this, this heavy layer. Okay? And this, uh, when you derive this equation, what are you doing? You're assuming that you have a balance between the buoyant stresses and the viscous stresses, and that simplifies things down to one uh, conservation equation, and the equation is governed by a single parameter, uh, chi here, which measures the, the difference between the viscous effects due to the imposed flow and, and buoyancy, okay? and buoyancy in the, in the axial direction. So it's kind of nice. We, we, could, we could have a one parameter system, and now we could solve this. Okay, so this is a, an efficient way of, of doing the computation. And this type of equation tends to have interfaces that spread out in the same way that the experiment does. And we were able to um, predict from this that this, the velocity of the front, okay, by solving this equation. In fact, you, even, uh, you don't even need to solve the equation to predict the front velocity. And we were able to predict a critical value of chi uh, at which, um, instead of the, the front going just downstream, uh, part of the front would move back upstream against the flow. Okay. So we could, we could separate, um, we could separate the, the, the observation in that way. Okay, so this is nice. We, we now have a prediction of the dynamics of one of these regimes that we, we observe. And we took our experiments and we um, plotted the front velocity defined by uh, chi uh, and uh, the, the mean flow. So you scaled with the viscous uh, velocity scale, and this is the front velocity scale for the viscous velocity scale. And what we find is that most of our data here uh, in this, this regime here, where, where I think the viscous collapses nicely onto this black curve. And that's the, the curve of the front velocities that we can predict from this, uh, this lubrication part of the back that I just found. Okay. Um, <clears throat> down here, you can see that things don't fall onto the curve very well. And these are really the inertial flows, okay? So there we had to um, fall back to more basic things where we would say, well, these are inertial, so the proper scale, the front velocity should be the inertial velocity scale. And we were able to fit this to a, um, a quadratic expression of the Froude number. And again, the Froude number here uh, is inertia versus buoyancy. So this seems like the right parameter to use for these flows, which are inertial things. OK? And um, we went up here, we were able to fit with the, the, the lubrication. Okay, so that, that's kind of a, um, a snapshot of, of the sort of methodology we're trying to use. Okay, so we use the, the experiments or we would use computation. We understand roughly what's going on physically. And we try to pick out these regimes where we are able to do something simpler. Okay, and eventually what happened was we, we were able to uh, put all our results onto one uh, plot here. So here I have the proof number, here I have uh, Reynolds space divided by the food number. You can think of this as flow rate on the on the x-axis. This one is buoyancy. Okay, that's that's a sort of representation of what it is. And we were able to categorize our our results so that um, in each of these segments we could uh, describe what was happening. Okay, but we could also give a very simple model that, that would predict the front velocity. Okay, so. 
example, this one an inertial exchange flow, this one would be a, a temporary backflow, the viscous exchange dominated, uh, and, and this, this one was a, what we call imposed flow dominated. Okay, so we have these categorizations of that, that are maybe not particularly important to understand for each one. Okay? But the main point of this is that in each case we were able to provide a, a symptom model. Um, so, uh, <coughs> we did a lot more work on, on these, um, these are some of the things we, we studied, I won't show um, many of these. I'll talk a little bit about the TFD in a minute. Uh, but th that really was our study on, uh, on near horizontal. Uh, okay. so the next thing we did, we did was we, we moved on to, uh, uh, to, to higher inclinations. Okay. So higher inclinations are, um, you know, a lot of different things begin to happen. Okay, so, so um, again, we work with, a, with the same flow loop. We modified it a little bit, and um, we tried to keep to a similar range of, uh, of parameters here that would again allow us to get large buoyancies. Okay, so large, large buoyancy forces, but using fluids with relatively small density differences. Okay, so this looseness approximation. So the same idea, and now this is not just mounted on a hydraulic jack, we have to uh, do some more, uh, more plumbing to, to get things connected up. Um, and uh, we ran probably a few hundred uh, experiments in this, in this, uh, these inclinations. That's what it really looks like. And uh, see my lab has no windows. Pretty miserable being my graduate student. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, so what happens? Okay, so it's the same experiment, okay, same setup. So we have the same three uh, velocities, okay, and the inclination, okay, or we have the Reynolds number, the fruit number, and the inclination. Okay, so the same setup. Um, <coughs> Well, the phenomena you observe are quite different, okay? We, we go from uh, these nice stratified flows down there when we're near the horizontal, and as we increase the intonation, well, we get progressive amounts of mixing. So it's things, you know, around 70 degrees here were the ones we, we called inertial, okay? But now you can see that the, the mixing is beginning to, to go across the channel and become increasingly complete, and once we get up to around here, there's complete transverse mixing. So that's the main type of transition. So we, uh, um, <clears throat> we did the same kind of things, and uh, what we found now was this edge detection worked pretty well for the high inclinations and maybe a thing for things like this. But once you begin to get up to these, um, to, to these um, uh, uh, inclinations where we have a lot more mixing, then the edge detection doesn't work particularly well. Um, so we had to figure out a different way of measuring the front velocity. And these are a range of front velocity uh, measurements. The, the colors are for, are for different, um, uh, uh, different post flow velocities. And these are the different upward numbers. But the main trend you see is that things kind of go up and there's a bit of a plateau and they come back down. So here, in this region, was the study I already showed you. And the, the general trend here is actually very similar to the things that we find without any imposed flow. Okay, so things tend to go up, plateau, up like that. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. It's similar to a uh, thing you, you've already um, been taught about, the Boycott effect, where, where you know, if you're putting solids in a pipe, the, the, the inclination where they exchange positions tends to be in the middle. You know, they exchange positions fastest in the middle. Okay? This is very similar. Okay, and the point is, it's not changed particularly when we start to up okay, the same positive picture. Okay, so um, uh, what we did, we tried to understand our, our results in terms of the front velocity. This was the previous study, which fitted in roughly down here, and now when we change the inclination, well, cos beta is much bigger, so I cover a much wider uh, range of parameters. And what you can see here is that there's some, um, each dot here is, a, is one experiment, and the color code here is the front velocity. So the front velocity here has been scaled with the mean flow velocity. Okay, so you can see that some of these up here 
uh, you know, three, two to three times the, the mean flow velocity. Okay, so they're really racing down downstream. And if you think about what that means, I'm pumping at speed v0. If something's moving three times, two times the speed, then probably something's moving back upstream as well. Okay? The average is one. And if you've got three going down there, then you've probably got minus one going the other direction. Okay? And so uh, here's the same kind of plot, but I've, I've uh, filtered out everything over over two. And you can see these kind of group in here. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of displacements here where we're getting this backflow, okay, going back up the pipe. And that's, that's obviously not very, very good for uh, you know, cementing. And then we get the ones which I've drawn a circle around. So the ones with a circle around, they go straight down the pipe. Okay, we call those instantaneous displacements. And you can see there's a transition of a, a group number of round two. Um, and uh, if you come back down here, uh, many of these were, were viscous, exactly as we found in the other study. Um, and the other thing is you can see that as we come up here, around here, we get to values of around one. So that means that the front is moving at the mean close. Okay, so these tend to be mixed and they're very effective displacements. Okay, so you might think mixing is bad, but in fact mixing is good. Okay, so, so when you when you mix in displacement then uh, well then you displace. Okay? Uh, and if you don't mix then you have this opportunity to really spread out. Okay. okay um, <clears throat> so yeah going back to the mixing uh, so if I come to these Experiments up here where we're getting a front velocity close to one. This is what's happening. Okay. Uh, this is where we're getting transverse mixing. Okay. And so what does that mean when we say the mean velocity is one? Well, the mean velocity at the front is one, but things are still still spreading out. Okay. And they're spreading out through this mixing and then through the process of axial diffusion. So we can uh, we we can see that if we try to collapse the data. Okay, so a typical uh, diffusive process is uh, you know, like x over root t. So we subtract off the mean flow and we scale with t. And these blue lines here are the profiles of the mean concentration. So the, the average, so be, so the average concentration is c equals 0 0.5. Okay, so that is the uh, the average position of the interface. And you can see that for many of them, they they collapse very nicely onto this black curve, which is a a fit to a complementary error function. Okay, this is a bit crude, but but out of this we can estimate um, from the shape of the, of the curve. We can estimate a, a diffusivity. Okay, and we so we put out this diffusivity into a couple of values, and I can show you that you know I would say uh, about half of the data works very nicely in this way, and then you get a, you get some things that just don't work. They're neither diffusive nor This is, again, a very nice characterization because now if I've got a, a, a diffusive process and I can characterize the diffusivity, then again, I've got a, a type of model which is 1D, okay? And I, and I can predict quite quickly what's happened to the process, okay? So I don't have to solve the full 3D problem. I can, I can, uh, I, I can use this diffusivity and do a nice 1D model. Okay, so our, we, we try to classify the, re, the regimes and this is type of thing we, we got. We got viscous regimes down here where we had this simple lubrication model. We had these intermittent inertial regimes here where we uh, had this fit based on crude numbers and we had to modify that because we had a much wider range now of, uh, of uh, data. And then finally we, we had a, a fully diffusive regime up here where we managed to uh, again correlate something for the, for the diffusivity. So um, this, this was really our, you know, our, our experimental study. So um, you know, what, what that really led us to was a, was a, a 1D model for, for the process. Okay. So that's kind of nice. Uh, so now we, we, we also wanted to do some computational work. And um, uh, the problem with doing computational work for exactly this problem is that if we're going to do exactly the same flows, well, they're, they're all 3D, okay? And um, 
the even for the, the large scale experiment that we're running, uh, we were roughly 200 diameters long. Okay, and so to do a 200 that diameters long three dimensional pipe flow with two fluids, it, it is it's going to be complicated. Okay, it's going to take a long time. And so we, uh, um, you know, doing the doing the simulation here. I think even if we'd spent the time to try and parallelize the code, it would have been slower than the experiment. Okay? And, um, and then there was another question of what we were going to do with all the data. And I don't mean that in a, in a poor way. Yeah, you generate the data, you've got to interpret it. And uh, um, we, we just weren't ready to do that. Okay? So, so instead what we did, we, we used two-dimensional computation. We used them quite extensively. And so we moved to a plain channel. So a channel is not a pipe, okay? But um, what do we hope to do by, by doing this? Well, uh, the flows are similar. I mean, they're both shear flows, they're both displacement flows. We expect to get very similar characteristics, okay? And so partly we're looking to benchmark our understanding of the pipe flow by doing simulations, okay? Partly, uh, the type of simple models we've produced for the pipe, well, it should be easier in a plain channel. I guess, 2D model. So, so again, we, we want to really uh, benchmark our, our understanding of this process. And that, that's really our motivation for doing um, uh, simulations. Okay. So the code we use is, is something called Pelicans. Um, and this is a bit like open foam. Okay? It's, it's, it, any of you have used open foam, it's very, very similar back of structure, okay, where you can build up uh, solvers for Navier Stokes systems. Um, we use that CDE form of formalism, the concentration uh, diffusion equation that I, sh I showed earlier. Um, it's a mixed finite element finite volume scheme. Um, and it's, uh, we used it mainly because the people we, uh, we, who, who gave it to us had already implemented a lot of the non-Newtonian models. Okay, so didn't have to do too much work uh, uh, for these things, even though the things I've shown you actually have uh, have nothing to do with, with non-Newtonian fluids. Everything I've shown you is Newtonian. Okay? Um, so we, uh, we we check this. Uh, you know, so we use this code, um, and we, we did a fairly large computational study just to, to cover the same type of range as the as the experiments. Okay? So I'll just show you some examples of this. This is a, an example of things. That were close to horizontal. Uh, here's different output numbers. Each of these um, is an image of the concentration, so the blue fluid displaced into red uh, 25 seconds after the start of the displacement. So you can see here, you know, would be the initial position of the two fluids. Um, each panel has a different inclination, and and as you go down any panel, you've got a, a increase in the and so what you can see here uh, is you, you get a very similar behavior qualitatively as before. We, we go from uh, things down here, which are largely viscous, okay, where, where we have a, a fairly well-defined uh, interface, uh, to things up here, which are largely inertial mixed. Okay, so that's increasing the, the angle of inclination, increasing the density difference. Okay, up, up and uh, uh, some, some minor minor effects of, of velocity. Okay, so the the aspect ratio of these is not it's not one to one. This is one, and I think this is. Uh, I forgot. It's either it's either twenty five or hundred units long. Okay. So I think the, the computations were done over hundred units, but um, I'm not sure if I'm showing hundred units there. Okay. I'm guessing it must be twenty something. Maybe it's 20, 25 units after the, the gate or something. Anyway, it's it's a long it's it's longer. Um, this is a type of uh, effect we had when we we start to look at um, uh, inclinations. Okay, and again, it's very similar to the experiment. It's a nice structured flows here. Okay, and progressively uh, getting less structured and mixing. Uh, there's also differences. So whereas the pipe always slumps to the bottom. You know, here, the displacement always leaves a bit of a layer, although this type of front is advancing. Okay? 
So um, again, some some differences between in, in the detail of the flows, but but still fairly similar um, quality. Um, we were able to take out uh, front velocity and diffusion measurements out of these. Uh, not particularly interesting on their own. Um, and we were able to again construct this type of uh, flow regime map uh, as, we, as we had done for, um, for the uh, pipe flow. Okay. Slightly different, but again, uh, a lot of similarity. So here we have the the intermittent inertial flows, the viscous flows up here, fully diffusive flows about here. Okay. Again, kind of similar. It basically served to validate that we, what what we found in our experiments was, it was a reasonable understanding of, uh, of, the, of this type of flow. Um, and that's the that's the pipe geometry one uh, for comparison. Uh, then we, we found a lot of other interesting things, okay, and this is where you, you know, I, I can see if the uh, wins by a long way because it, it's so much easier to see what's going on in, in, in the flow, okay. Um, you know, so we found uh, various things where we, where the backflow would, would re, you know, we'd initially kill a backflow and then it would reform, so you've got some flow coming back here, so this is a uh, consequence of mixing. Uh, Cameron gave these all exotic names, which probably won't survive into the paper, but they, they were all exotic names. So we front detachment, okay, where the front here is moving much faster than the imposed flow and basically runs off ahead. Okay. Uh, the leaking front, I don't know what that means. Okay, but it's a front that's leaking. Okay. And, uh, and actually, it's very interesting when you start. You know, this is part of the, also the beauty of CFD with the problem. You know, you end up with these these, these great phenomena, and then you, you have to actually try to, to characterize them. You know, and, and and you know, is this phenomena distinct from the previous one? And then you have to do something. I think there's a lot of challenge. Uh, spike the displacing tip. We decided this isn't the spike. This is, but this is an inertial effect. Okay, close to the tip. You always have inertia, and you always have some form of recirculation. So this is um, uh, this is really uh, um, a dispersive effect that always happens. Uh, and then classical things like the Brady tailings. So when the channel is vertical, you know we reproduce this type of Brady Taylor effect. You know um, channel which remains symmetric until it evolves far enough, and then the symmetry breaks. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the nice things here is you, you generate a lot of things that you would like to study um, further, um, but which were not, you know, were not really, I'd say, in the objective of what you started off trying to do. Okay, so um, just to, to summarize what, what came out of the combined uh, uh, displacements, while well, we uh, we extended the, the range, we found fully mixed regimes. Um, both if we increase the, the fruit number, either the flow rate, or if we increase Reynolds possibly to the fruit, which is the buoyancy. And the type of um, the type of transition is a little bit different in each case. So the fruit number transition is more or less a classical type of, uh, of uh, shear transition. And, uh, and the, the, the Reynolds cos beta one is really that the mechanism there is the fronts are advancing and then you end up having you know, uh, heavy fluid and light fluid next to each other, and so they, they want to, to destabilize the to destabilize the things. Okay? So quite different um, uh, driving forces. Um, we understood more about the viscous regime and the, and the exchange dominated regime. Um, we were able to predict a lot of things. So some of these transitions, I haven't really um, gone into in detail on these, but we were able to predict. Um, Quite a number of transitions that we'd like to like to predict. Okay, um, we were uh, published a lot of these things. Uh, I, can, I can send uh, um, references. But the nice thing about doing this it was a well, the very nice thing was that it was a um, industrially funded uh, project. Okay, but we were able to do some quite fundamental uh, fluid mechanics. 
And uh, you know, and I think that's a, that's a really nice thing about um, many of the problems in the oil field that you, you need to develop uh, fluid fundamentals, which are just not quite there, you know. And so, in doing those, if you're interested in the, in the science of um, fluid mechanics, then I think you know you can you can uh, you, you can enjoy yourself um, quite a lot in, in solving these problems, and uh, and they 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 they're, they're useful plus they. They're useful scientifically. Okay. Um, so uh, a lot of these are, are, are not on the problem I've shown. They're on some of the extensions, the non-Newtonian uh, flows. Um, so you know, to summarize this, so I think we've developed a, what I say, a reasonable understanding of these two fluid problems, with definitely with Newtonian fluids. Um, I, I, we've partly extended this to viscosity ratios of to Newtonian fluids and then to things like shear thinning fluids. So the results are not, are not shown, but the, we've, we've published many of these things. Um, the, the main thing we, we kind of learn is when you, when you want to study these things in depth, it really takes takes a long time. Um, yeah, we we try to do a comprehensive study. I've shown you a lot more experimental than computational, um, but all of these approaches uh, fit together. Okay, and so. <clears throat> Um, what we try to do is focus on these bulk quantities, and in doing so, you also un uncover many, uh, many interesting phenomena that, that could be studied in a more scientific way in, in greater depth. Okay, so I think the, these things also work here. Um, okay, so uh, the methodologies. I wanted to return to this. These are some of the things we used. I started off with a very simple dimensional analysis, and I, 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 I think that's that's the most useful thing. You know, I think you know, you've ever learned is to, is to start with complex problems by just write down the thing in, in whatever you're going to study. And see, see how bad the situation is. Because okay? I think that has to that has to govern the way you you approach the problem. Okay? You have to really think about how much work you can do. Okay? I think that's the first thing. Um, and CFD, okay, play the role, maybe not the dominant role. Okay. Uh, a lot of semi-analytical methods. Okay, I showed you a little bit of the thin film. I didn't show you many of this or this one. We also did some hydrodynamic stability. I showed you a lot of the experiments. And then there's always a lot of cooking, you know, where you where you just have to um, things that just don't, you know, aren't very elegant. And uh, so if you if you're a mathematician like I pretend to be some half my time, then then you don't have to deal with that. But if you're an engineer like I pretend to be the other half of my time. You know, you, you, you can't just say to your the person who's funding the research, well, I, I don't care about those points. You know, so, so you do have to you do have to do some of the things that you know maybe not so elegant, but we you know, fit the curve. You know, you're crazy not to. <laughs> um, and I think the main thing is, is since understanding is, is the, the main uh, difficulty in all of this. Okay, so I wanted to uh, to come back to, to my provocative. Friend here, uh, it was very provocative at times. Yeah, you can imagine he, he was. He, I think he's retired now, but he's sort of a guy who likes to sit around Oxford drinking tea and and uh, uh, like cricket and stuff like this. Anyway, um, you know, first thing is the context. He said this around 1990, so that was when I was coming into graduate school, and um, uh, I, I was introduced to computing at that, that time, and. Uh, and we were introduced that on a, on a microvax, okay, which doesn't exist, I'm pretty sure, except in the museum. And you know, this is the thing that's got a command line, and would tell you that your program wasn't running. You know, there was a problem, but it wouldn't tell you where it was. You know, and then you'd have to debug this thing and, and write some more Fortran 77 and hit the button again, and and it, and it took a long time even to solve the Poisson equation on a square. You know, so. Um, and, and this guy, you know, he 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 came from a, a tradition of uh, applied mathematics, you know, the dates back to, to G.I. Taylor, you know, and, and applied mathematics in close close relation to fluid mechanics. And um, so coming, you know, in, into the uh, the 80s and the 90s, well, the numerical analysis and computation is is arriving, and uh, and uh, you know. He, he, he was interested in practical problems, and, and he was rising to the challenge of solving some of these practical problems using approximation, using a hard analysis, perturbation methods, and, and uh, figuring out difficult 
on the problem. So you know, for him to, just to see to see that some of these you know, nonlinear partial differential equations, things like the Navier-Stokes equations, could actually maybe eventually become solvable at the at the push of a button. Um, you know, it was maybe not the most well, maybe not the most well thing. That's maybe you know part, part of the context of the times, okay? And um, so, uh, uh, that's maybe what I'd like to say about the, the context. So, what are the alternative uh, versions of this? Well, I, I think there's there's quite a few of them. The first thing I think is we, we always need to think before we compute. Okay? I think if you start computing before you you have thought about the problem you're doing and uh, the trouble you might get into. Uh, you know, that's just the worst thing in the world. Okay? Uh, so that's, that's a milder version of this. Uh, and I think we should always think after we compute as well. Okay? I think that's the other thing that, you know, uh, and particularly these days, you know, the world is full of data. And do you need to create more data? You know, because you, you know, you, you're going to, you, you, you're going to fill up gigabytes of data so quickly. And you, you really have to analyze that get back to the problem you're trying to solve. Because the problem you're trying to solve is not maybe the CFD problem. It's, it's the physical problem at the end, you know. So, uh, I think, yeah, think after we compute. Uh, so, third version is, it's like, I think computation now doesn't replace modeling or analysis or experimentation, okay? Um, but, I, but I think it's, it's really a wonderful complement to these. And I think we're in an era where we, we can, uh, we can do so many things that you know we can't do with with the, the modeling and the analysis, and we can do it in, in a detail that we, we could never do. Okay, so you know that, that's a you know um, certain com computation has really come of age, and uh, you know and we should be using it. Um, and uh, I think this is maybe the last one. I think it's, it's truly epic problems where you know many IFO problems are like this, where you have a, an astonishing Complexity. Uh, you really need a synthesis of approaches. And you can't do uh, without, um, uh, you know, without any of these. Um, so maybe the, you know, one of the questions might be, well, if you should think before we compute, or if you should think after we compute, what should we do when we're computing? <laughs> okay, so I think when we're computing, that's the thing. Is you, that's when you go and you do your modeling and your analysis, and your, maybe. Maybe your experimentation, or, you, or, or maybe you just go and have a beer. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you for your, your attention. Uh, right after the seminar, thank you for a wonderful seminar. Uh, and, uh, we have a, uh, before we do the question,